Hello, my name is Dr. Freddy Garcia, and once again, we're joined by Professor Carrick, which is, uh, we're doing volume two of Ted and Fred's Excellent Adventure, answering your guys' questions you submitted. Professor, what's going on? Good day, Freddy. It's good to see you again. So it's, yeah. Listen, I, I have so many questions, so I want to just jump right into it. Can we do that? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so let me see. Um, one that I saw that I like is... All right, we have a scholar that wrote and they said, I'm trying to be, get more integrated into the medical community to let them know what a clinical neuroscience approach is and what it can do. And he, he noticed some similarities. He goes, I guess neurooptometrists really see a lot of the same patients that we do. What are some of the recommendations that you have to integrate yourself into that community so there can be a symbiotic relationship? It's actually a very common question. I, I found it interesting that they, they pointed out the neurooptometrists are seeing a lot of the patients. I think that's actually come to light in the last couple of years, more people becoming aware of that. I got to tell you, five years ago, I didn't really hear that many people talk about neurooptometry. It's become very, uh, it, at least more, vision, more in front of people in regards to how powerful that can be. And I agree that that's a, it's a good tool um, and love the work they're doing. But uh, what, do, what do you think? How do they become more integrated? Well, I can tell you what I did. And uh, just historically speaking, um, if, if you're doing the things that we do, oftentimes you're outside of, of that mainstream. But one thing that definitely doesn't work is telling people all about the things that you do or you're qualified to do or telling them stories because people really don't, don't care about that. Could be crap. But what does make a difference if you want to be integrated is your patient outcomes. That makes a, a significant difference. So what I did, and and years ago, it was different. It wasn't as fast. We didn't have word processing. There was no emails. It was letters. But every patient that I saw, I would send um, a thank you note to all of the people that were on their healthcare team. That's something that everyone did. So that if you're a specialist and you see someone in their general practitioner or their primary contact one, out of courtesy, I would give them a copy of my narrative. And I, I wrote very good narratives, and they weren't long narratives, and they weren't, um, but they were exact, like patient came in with this and this. And I gave my examination, which was, you know, probably, and, and I, to say this modestly, uh, was, was better than, than anyone else had done. I was trained well to do a good physical exam and record it and interpret it, so that's what I did. And then I gave them, uh, you know, what I did, and boom. And it wasn't very long before almost every healthcare practitioner in my local area was getting, you know, five and six letters a week from me, you know, thanking them. And after a while, you know, I was just there. So I think the way to integrate, if you're not on staff at your hospital, if uh, and, and you you probably should get out there, get into that community, or attend rounds, or go to your local university, so people uh, can do. But don't try to sell yourself. You don't have to. It's it's like if you're a good guitar player, telling people about the history of guitars and how guitars sound really great is not going to do something. But if you take that thing out and you start strumming a few chords, and go, my gosh, this is amazing. That's the way to do it. So it's by outcomes because. You can talk as much as you want about how great um, a functional neurological approach is in the treatment of concussion, but if you've only seen one or two of them, it doesn't matter. You've got no credibility. So look at the patients that you have and uh, correspond. You don't do a narrative report just when people ask you to do something. So keep it in there. Have the appropriate releases uh, for you to send to their patients. And that's something that we've always done. So if you see uh, Freddy's Garcia, you say, who's your family doctor? Have you seen who's your dentist? You know, well, look at you, you probably have a psychiatrist as well. You know, look at all of these people and then give the uh, a release form so that people can uh, send it out there and then you send a copy of that release form with the narrative and make sure it's of quality. Uh, and, and learn to do this so that I would have, by the time people would come in and leave my office, that letter would be in the mail, it'd be transcribed, it would be out. But also I videotaped people from the late 70s so that they'd have a copy of that videotape would be to the referring doctor as well so people could see 
of what we're doing. So integration means that you've got to show your work. Uh, you're not going to refer to a surgeon uh, unless you've seen what that person has done. You know, what are the outcomes? And this means more than a, a Facebook page or looking at, you know, somebody where you've got so many, you know, likes or dislikes, but really what, what happens and uh, what do people think about them? So I think that's the best way. It certainly worked for me in a very short period of time. People will know the quality of your work as a consequence of the outcome. And then they'll speak to the patients. And that's the real truth. In other words, you're not talking about it, you're doing it. You're showing them your, uh, your performance. That's societally responsible as well. You will get mega referrals. Uh, Professor Carrick, when you wrote those letters, uh, did you ever have the, the clinicians can I give you a call or write you back and be like, hey, can you explain this or this or why did this happen? You ever have that happen or did they just kind of accept it and, and go along with it? All the time. I've had it for different things. I had one guy who actually called me up just to tell me um, uh, he was a member of the AMA and they considered the chiropractors are quacks and boom. A year and a half later, he became one of my best friends because I just kept on sending him stuff. After a while, he was like a white rat. He just had to refer because I was thanking him for referring even people he didn't refer. So uh, it, it worked out well, but many of them would be. And I, I remember one fellow, uh, he's dead now, I just found out, but he was a really great OBGYN guy. And I would um, see, I saw like almost the entirety of, of these pregnant uh, gals because they didn't want them to take any drugs because they were pregnant. So they treated them at a higher level. Well, guess what? If you're treating, if you treat everyone as if they're a pregnant man or a woman, then you're going to do a better job. In other words, we're going to, if you're pregnant, then don't eat this processed meat and don't do this and don't take this drug. Well, just, you know, pass it on. But I remember him describing the sacroiliac joint movement, you know, and saying, you know, I want to refer this person is, I think they have a loss of anterior inferior glide of the sacrum on the ilium upon heel strike, because they would read my notes and go, that's just fantastic. And then of course they would see me because I would be in the labor and delivery and boom. And, and they go like, this is amazing. So they'd want to do that analysis uh, so they can come through, but all of the time, but again, you're not going to write an epistle. You don't want to write things like this. Some people write things with references, you know, according to Sam and Sam, you know, the SI, who cares about this? You know, what do they have? What did you find? Uh, and the typical things, you know, that people gloss over the blood pressure, blah, 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 blah. And then what did you do? And so if you can get it into like a, a nice narrative, like an elevator talk page, page, people will read that. They're going to go right down to your clinical assessment and if it's reasonable it's going to uh, it's going to work when i first started doing this i had no money i used to go down to the the walrus and they'd have the typewriters that were out there that you could check out when you're going to buy them i was really dirt poor so i would you know get my paper and i put it in the thing i would type out my letters you know for the first week or so and then when i started making some money i bought a typewriter and then uh, onwards, and it didn't take too long before I could afford to have people type the letters. But at first, I was just doing it myself. None of this uh, word processing. You make a mistake. I mean, I think I had the I had spent more money on whiteout than I than I did on headrest paper. <laughs> you know, and now clinicians do it even easier, right? Because they do drag and dictate with like the medical words that they could literally, uh, you know, talk to the computer and get that all written up pretty easily. Yeah, make it which, short. Which is, Make it short. Yeah. Oh, you're right. That's, that's great. Uh, let's get another good question. I like this one. Um, let me see where to go. All right. So this must come from uh, a manual therapist. Uh, you know, we had questions come in from all different professions, by the way, acupuncture, athletic trainer. We had medical physicians. We had different education levels too. We had a P, couple, P, couple PhDs. Some people were new to us. Uh, some people have been with us for a while. It was pretty neat to see all these questions. This yeah. one's a manual therapist. And they asked, uh, Professor Carrick, how do you specifically differentially diagnose a joint position error, a primary joint position error, um, which needs to be corrected from one that is secondary, secondary or compensatory and need to be left alone? And I, I think that's an interesting question. Well, what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, it's a great question, and it really depends upon where the joint dysfunction is. If it's in the neck or the low back or the elbow or the knee, there's different uh, parameters. But, but let's, let's answer it in a real, um, in a clinical reality, because oftentimes you just don't know until you correct it. And if you correct it and things go south, you probably should have left it alone. That's the reality of these, of these things. So um, when we look at joint dysfunction, everyone has one. And you'll have to compare that joint dysfunction, especially in the neck, to what is happening in other parts of the body that are linked. And, and we see this primarily with the eyes. So that if I am really uh, stiff, uh, for instance, on the left side of my neck, I'm not gonna be able to move my head to the right. I'm not gonna be able to let go of that activity. So that if we find that your, uh, the relationship or the gain of your neck movement is less than the gain of your eye movement, so if you follow a target, the eyes are moving, then there's a very good probability that that neck is too tight for a variety of reasons. And it could be due to a dystonic relationship or it could be due to a frontal lobe uh, aberrancy and integration that comes into, uh, into the basal ganglia or so. So oftentimes what I do is when I look and I find there's a joint dysfunction and I say, boy, you know, th this joint is, is tight or it's fixed or we've got, um, some spasticity of muscles uh, because it's it's compensating because if you tilt your head you're going to get dizzy something like that i would do something to provoke the symptoms and then i would see if i could correct it with a non-joint sort of uh, a mechanism for instance if it's uh, uh, say a left frontal activity and you've got increased tenacity in the right side of your neck. I might want to do something complex with movements of the left arm. If that didn't do it, it's probably the joint. It's probably not a cerebellipital aspect of the frontal lobe. But at the end of the day, if you've never seen the patient before, you may have a hard time to know what is a primary or a secondary. And as with all things, if you, if you address that, and you find that things uh, do well for them, then it probably was primary. If you address that and you find that the next day it comes back and it's tight again, then it probably was a compensatory mechanism and you probably shouldn't have gone there. There's no sense, for instance, to manipulate a joint every other day or three times a week. If you're doing that, then it's probably secondary to something else that you've missed. So it's a, it's a good window uh, with joint, stimulations we like to look at the relationships of joints to brain that's something that i've done you know forever uh the more the more proximal joints usually have a greater representation to brain than the more distal or to say differently if you treat more distal joints you're going to have less of an effect on brain function than more proximal joints so it's a little more forgiving in regards to that sort of effect. So if I've got a problem in the left side of my neck, I'll oftentimes do a stimulation of the left wrist or the elbow just to see what happens in regards to uh, brain activity. In other words, if there, if there's saccades towards the side of the uh, fixation or the joint disturbance become worse when you manipulate an elbow, then you probably don't want to manipulate the neck uh, in regards to that. Uh, that sort of effect. If you've seen the patient before and you know biomechanically what they're doing, it becomes pretty easy because if they have something that's a new type of fixation or so, then it's probably a primary. In days gone by, we would see patients that used to have travel cards and they'd uh, go to their doctor and they'd have the lesion uh, of the, the level, for instance, of what they call their subluxation. We'd be down the shirt up, it was there. And I never got into the trap of going, yeah, it's C3, and I did the same, and I would go like, why is this still here? This person's had this travel card, it's been good for 30 years. Maybe there's something else. So I would search for something else, and, and almost, I mean, not all the time, but a good percentage of the time, I would find when I corrected something else, and all of a sudden that, that lesion would just go away. I didn't even have to, to do anything. So um, You'll find that you're right if you correct something and it goes away, then, then you knew it was the primary. If, if it comes back, it's probably compensatory to something else. And sometimes with people, 
you're going to have some compensation that you need. So if I've got a, a trochlear nerve lesion and I can't move my eye down and in, then I'm going to tilt my head to compensate for it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get a joint fixation. But what are you going to do? If you've got a frank lesion, I mean, they're going to have to live with that and you're going to have to do some things to enable them to do better. So you would rehab those with, for instance, with an eyes closed mechanism, give them exercises with the eyes closed so they don't become diplopic when they, uh, when they do it. And there's all sorts of different variables. I don't know if that answers things um, in, a, in, a, in a beneficial way to people, but it's an honest way because uh, you'll make people worse when you do the wrong thing and you make people better when you do the right thing and sometimes it's it's just a judgment uh, a judgment call uh, and in your personal experience and in your gut so different tests in the neck makes it a little easier because you could look at movement of the head and seeing what the neck looks like or you can hold the head straight and then move the uh, you know the body to see how much is vestibular, how much is neck proprioceptive. Uh, and then you can do some different sort of techniques. We talked about snags the other day. Uh, there's many people, if you've been doing this for a while, you'll find you can affect the neck by manipulating the SI joint or by putting, you're manipulating the foot or putting an orthotic or manipulating a knee or doing whatever. So in your armamentarium, there's many things that you can do with experience that will let you know whether or not addressing a certain level is going to have anything that's going to be lasting. If it comes back the next day or two days later, it probably wasn't what you should have done. Excellent. You know, one course <clears throat> that I think a lot of scholars when they first come into us, if they're manual therapists that they enjoy is our adjusting courses that are taught. We have a couple faculty, but always very popular when you teach them. And I think, when they have that paradigm shift from adjusting things from a purely biomechanical, biomechanical perspective to a neurobiomechanical perspective, meaning we're now taking into account the patient's individual neurology, I think that blows away a lot of clinicians. When they have that shift, I think that is the beginning of them never being able to look at their patients the same way again. I, I was lucky enough to go on tour with you when you were doing a bus, uh, several adjusting courses a couple years ago. I was filming them, and I always tell the story of how there would be a, a you know, you're, pack, you're showing these techniques on doctors, you know, 60, 80 doctors in a room, uh, everybody standing the whole time. And, it, and as soon as one doctor would get off the table, another one, even though in the middle of your lecture, would slide right onto the table because they wanted to be next to be adjusted by you. And what I think was most amazing to me was here we had all these manual therapists who had been getting adjusted and doing passive work, active work, exercises still had some sort of issue, right? They would tell you about them and then you would adjust them. And then the doctor would turn and be like, you know, like you, you fixed this for me. Like, what, what did you do? And it's like, <laughs> but it, I found it funny that they, you know, they had been adjusted and done all these things lots of times, but you had a different approach, you know, and you would, and you would adjust them. And all of a sudden the doctor would kind of turn and I would be like, it was just amazing every time I saw those classes and saw you adjust that many people in a day. Yeah, that's really good. I think, you know, we all have our skill sets and some are better with one thing or the other. But if you look at like some of these basketball stars and the guy can go to the center line and pop them in, pop them in, pop them in. And then you look at other basketball players and they can't do it. So if you did like a controlled study and you just took a bunch of uh, basketball players that were elite basketball players and you got them to throw from the center line, you might make a conclusion that it was not possible to do the thing that you just saw done by Michael Jordan or somebody else. So the techniques that, that I utilize are um, high velocity, low amplitude manipulative techniques. That's what I do best, so that's what I, I like to do. And for some people, they may not have that uh, dexterity. So when we teach people, it's very interesting, a lot of people will look at manipulation and there'll be, you know, big guys and they'll muscle it in. Those are not good techniques. They're, they're, uh, they may get a crack or a release or so, but they can hurt people. We found for years, you know, for about 20, 25 years, we used to give a, 
uh, a technique award. And every year for, you know, again, for a quarter of a century, uh, a woman uh, won that, that award because we would teach people how to do manipulations based upon their size and the patient size, almost like when you play judo or so, where you use the patient's weight and stiffness against them, or you'd use the, the subluxation against them. And then we would teach them how to do manipulations with their fingertips. So uh, whether it be a low back or somebody who had, you know, people would always say, you know, no one's been ever able to manipulate my low back. And, and we'd show them just take a fingertip and here's the biggest crack they've ever seen in their life. It can be learned, but the technique that you would use in your size is different than I would use or somebody next to you. So if you teach people how to fight the, the joint enemy based upon their skills, you can increase their skill levels. So many times the outcomes that people get are because of the, you know, a decreased skill. Maybe it's just not cool for them and that's good to know. So they can increase their training to become at a better level or just say, hey, I'm not good at that shoulder, so I'm gonna send you to this person who really is good, but I'm really super good at a knee or so. Um, and that's about as, as humble as it is, but I know what you're talking about because when people come to a, a manipulation lecture, first of all, a lot of people get very surprised that these you know, neuro nerds that know all about this brain can, can manipulate like better than, uh, than the rank and file as a consequence of experience. And then all of a sudden when they have a manipulation, they, they're dumbfounded because the consequences are different than what they've had before. So the techniques that we teach are very vibrant and probably more vibrant because we, we make them uh, individuals. We don't talk necessarily about this is the line of drive and this, you know, because it changes for each person. And once they can palpate it and understand it, and then realize that, you know, if you find a problem on the left side of the neck and one on the right side, which one do you do? And you teach them a little subtle neurological localization that says it's more probable that the left side is going to give you a greater cortical consequence than the right. Uh, and they do the left side, all of a sudden, the releases that they get are markedly better because they might have gone to the right side first or, or so. And that can make a significant, uh, a significant difference. But manipulation is a skill. It's an art form. You know, it's, you know, it's you're playing piano. We always like to give the relationship that you don't hear too many. Maybe, maybe Beethoven can play like, dun, 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 you know, concerto for piezoform. But realistically, uh, the, the greatest bang for your buck is being able to use different angulations of force and direction with your fingertips. If you don't know it well, the only one you're going to hurt is going to be yourself, right? <laughs> but if you know how to do it, uh, your fingertips can have so much power. Um, you know, I break boards with my fingertips. You know, I learned that when I was, you know, a, a young guy. So you, you get a lot of power. Uh, certainly, if you hit the board wrong, you're going to not wish that you did it. So same thing with a uh, with a joint so little people can do maximum force with an adjustment and not hurt uh, hurt anybody but themselves you know basically and they don't if they're trained you know professor Carrick, it's funny that you mentioned uh, michael jordan earlier which is you know a goat one of the greatest of all time for basketball somebody asked a question about another person that i consider a goat and uh i guess they must know that you are a new england patriots fan yeah. I, I, yeah, I remember a few years ago, we were at an, an ISCN, the International Symposium in Clinical Neuroscience, and we had a, a, a Super Bowl party. And, and that was the greatest Super Bowl I've ever seen. Patriots versus the Falcons, right? Yeah. That, that comeback was amazing. It was, it was, it, I don't think it'll, I'll ever see a better Super Bowl than that. It was the most exciting thing I've ever seen in football. But they have a question. They said, uh, Professor Carrick, <laughs> what are your Patriots going to do? Now that Tom Brady is history, and uh, because he's he's he has a new team, he's left the Patriots. He's now with the the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, or I like to call them the Tampa Bay Patriots now. And uh, so, <laughs> what 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 are they going to do? What what's going to happen? That's an easy answer. They're going to win um, because they're a team, and you're going to see some amazing things with with Belichick. And I was a Patriots fan when the Patriots were the worst team in the league. You know, back in '79 and 
in the early 80s and things, a high school team could have beat the Patriots. And then everyone hates them because they're so good. That's what happens when you get good, people hate you. So Brady, you know, he's, he's the best of all time. But he really, he became the best because of some great players that allowed him to become uh, the best. So let's see who can catch him. I mean, let me tell you, have you seen that guy drill a ball? I mean, he's going to go right through those, some of those buccaneers, you know, right at the back. I don't know. They're going to have to retrain them all. We'll see. But I did try to get season's tickets, which you can't get just, just anyway. So, uh, but Patriots are going to win. I mean, that's, that's what's going to happen. And maybe Tampa well, will win too. We'll see. Well, well, I just saw a thing a couple of days ago that in like, Right now, the Tampa Bay uh, Buccaneers gear is outselling everybody else, and the, specifically Brady's gear has sold more than like ever before. So people are really excited about him coming down. And then there's a lot of free agents who are trying to get to the team because they know that he's a good quarterback, he's a smart quarterback, and he distributes the ball well. And I think the reason uh, receivers like him, because if you watch Brady play, he, he throws passes, but he never puts his receivers in vulnerable positions. He throws the ball low when he has to. And so, so I think it's going to be really interesting to watch him for the next couple of years. Uh, I do hope to catch a game, and we should, we should make that a trip. You know, that'd be, that'd be great. Let me tell you, it, it's going to be close, and the good thing is, I mean, I always have the, you know, the Sunday package. and You don't need it now because Tampa's local, so it's all going to be televised. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's going to be uh, pretty, pretty amazing. But let's hope we have a season. We'll see, you know, with all of this stuff that's coming on. We'll see. I know. And, you know, uh, for all athletes, hockey, basketball, what are they doing? I mean, you can sit there in your basement and you can throw, but you're, this is an entirely different world. How are these players going to do? Maybe they'll do better. Maybe taking that time off and developing their own athletic. We'll see, right? We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, hopefully our world will heal and come back. But I don't know, you know, what's happening here, our love of sports teams. but. Um, that's part of it, right? Uh, and I think the whole consequence of, of a team translates to the things that we're talking about by immersing ourselves in the community and being an essential part of it. If you're doing good, if you're the, if you're the Tom Brady, you can go anywhere and people are gonna wanna catch your ball. And with what we do, if you're good at what you're doing, people make notice really, really quickly. And just as some people, believe it or not, don't like Tom Brady because he's so good, there'd be some people that may not like uh, some of our colleagues that are just so good uh, as a consequence. But the majority of people want to catch that ball. So uh, team playing, what a perfect example. Watch the Patriots because they uh, are a team. And you watch what Belichick does with it. One guy's out. They got other guys that are going to come in. He'll have a different strategy. It's not going to be the same ball game that they're going to play. You watch. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, I, I do admire Belichick as a head coach. I think he's genius. I think he's the GOAT when it comes to coaching. And I'm actually excited to see how he's going to adapt. I do think he's short on talent. Um, but, but his genius in coaching is, I believe, undeniable. There you go. So we'll see. All right, Professor, I think that'll do for this volume of, uh, Fred, uh, of Ted and Fred's Excellent Adventure. Um, I have some more questions for you, but I think we're going to meet later today, and we'll, we'll do some more questions. Is that fair? Yeah, sure. That'd be great. All right. We'll catch you later, Professor. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye.